Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Tim Northup from the Northup Drum Museum. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bart. It's great to be here. Why don't we just hop in here and you can, just so people know, describe what the Northup Drums Museum is, and then we'll talk about how you kind of got into creating the museum. Sure. So the <clears throat> Northup Drums Museum is a actual playing museum, and there are very few of those in the world. I think there's one in Germany, but you can actually come to this museum and you can sit down and play all of these drums. And if you go to northupdrums.com on Facebook, you can look at all the stuff I have. Uh, anywhere from 1900 all the way to modern day kits, but we tend to focus around these guys right here, these painted drum heads. Yep. I, I'm an art dealer, an antiques dealer by trade, so I fell in love with this. these painted heads. They're all factory painted. Those are the ones that are here. There are a few itinerary, but mostly factory painted heads. So I fell in love with that era, which is 1920 to 1930, late 30s. Um, different scenes. You'll have a, a, this is kind of a classic lake scene with a moose. This is my favorite one from Ludwig. And then you'll have an Art Deco scene as you get into the 30s. So we show both of those in here. These are all set up as kits. You can sit down and play them with all the traps, sound effects, all that stuff. And it's all here. Massive collection, really. Uh, yeah, it's it's unbelievable uh, to see photos of it. As as I'm looking at pictures, you were recently featured in Modern Drummer, uh, oh, which, sweet. you know, it's like you've made it. You're in Modern Drummer. That's <laughs> okay. got to feel good. <laughs> so <laughs> here's how this is how I explain it to my friends uh, being a Modern Drummer, because some people are like, yeah, that's great. What's that? Well, I, I relate it to a kid playing baseball in high school. Right. You know, and then going on to maybe play in college but never making the major leagues. And then 30 years later, being inducted in the Baseball Hall of Fame. So when I say it like that, then people get, they're like, oh, wow, because I guess Modern Drummer is kind of our only like Hall of Fame type thing. But getting Modern Drummer is a big deal. You know, it's a big, it's it a lifelong a dream for lots of kids. Like, I, you know, I put in my Facebook post when I, when I did get a Modern Drummer, a, a picture of one of my Modern Drummers from 1988. And I said, you know, I used to sit and go through the magazine and play all the charts, you know, the best I could when I was a kid. And you always dream as a kid, oh man, someday I'm going to be a drummer in a big band or, you know, a rock band, and I'm going to be a modern drummer magazine. And then, you know, as you get, get hit college and the real world happens, you put that out of your mind pretty quickly, you know, as a regular drummer. And then all yeah. of a sudden, boom, you know, and I didn't really get in as a drummer, even though I do play. Uh, but I never really played professionally. I was a union musician, played gigs, you know, and got paid and stuff like that, but never on the, on the road, you know, with any big band or anything. But then I sure. built this collection, built this museum and wham, it gets featured in modern drum. So yeah, I'm very honored and humbled by that for sure. You know? Yeah. You and I are on the same kind of path there with though. We're like, I didn't play in any big, I've gigged for years and years, but mm -hmm. have not played in any massive major touring bands, just local stuff. And uh, we've kind of found backdoor entrances <laughs> to get into <laughs> For sure. yeah. like modern drummer. But yeah. that that's that's not saying that it's not a ton of work and uh, and your passion, you know, isn't it, it should be appreciated uh, mm -hmm. with the article, which it's in the August 2022 August issue 2022. They don't print it anymore. It's digital. So I kind of printed my own copy just to have it. But, you know, yep. we're not really supposed to show yep. it as you know, they want to sell subscriptions and I get that. But uh, you can go on sure. and read part of it. You know, the, the part of it's on there and so forth. So great visuals right off the bat looking at it of your painted heads collection um i'll i'll give a shout out to jim messina years ago he did an episode of the podcast on i think episode 16 if i'm not mistaken that's a total guess about painted heads and i know you know jim and you guys are buddies like all we of are. us are yeah um so it's really a fascinating history so jim jim gave the basic rundown of it but for someone who's maybe not in the know could you give the like elevator pitch kind of speech of why are they painted heads yep. and all that stuff just to kind of yep. catch everyone up so beginning in, a, in the mid 20s i would say i think 1922 25 they started showing up in the catalogs because these heads are calf skin and calf skin changes with it like we've had a really dry summer so it hasn't been too bad when it's really when it when it rains the head will take on whatever humidity is in the air and so they started putting heaters or lights inside bass drums to warm up that calf head so they didn't have to tune it so tight. These are mus playing musicians. Then I guess somebody decided, well, I've got a lit casket head. Let's paint a scene on it, you know, or maybe paint their band logo or whatever. 
So then they hired art, the actual, the factories, Leedy, Ludwig, Slingerland. Those are the main companies that I collect and that we show in here. They started cataloging certain scenes in their catalogs from the 20s all the way till really in the mid to late 30s. They were still offering a few select ones. Um, and for about $15, they made some 10 to $15 extra. You could have a painted head put on your, your drum with your set. You could order it from the, the company. So I basically have, there's a great um, photo that's circulating around the internet that, of a leady artist painting heads. And he's got all these heads lined up, all those familiar scenes we know from Leedy, and he's sitting there painting heads. So somebody, you know, they hired artists to sit there and, and duplicate these heads. So the moose was one that was offered. The spiderweb girl is a very classic one that was offered by Leedy and Ludwig, you know, different versions. That's more in the Art Deco scenes. Um, but I, I do focus my collection on those, like I said, because I love them and they're, they display great, but we play them. I mean, you don't play this side. This is the front side. You play the sure. batter side. Obviously, people get confused about that. But the other thing is that the painters had to learn how to paint. So the earlier drum heads, they just painted them, you know, oil on can like an oil on canvas. Well, these are oil on natural hide. Well, skin moves, you know, because it, it takes on humidity, it moves. So if you're not, if you don't paint it right, all the paint just flakes right off. And we've had tons of these heads that the paint is all flaking off because it's not painted correctly. They had to learn how to do stipple painting, kind of like George Seurat from uh, France. He learned how to do stipple paint. Sure. So the painters had to kind of not do long brush strokes. They had to stipple paint, and that made the paint stay on the heads a lot better. And you'll get them, and they'll always be a little flaking here and there. You can see some flaking here in the trees where it's a little thicker, where they had to do brush strokes with the tree. But, you know, and yeah. overall, they're, they're in good condition, though. It's fascinating. It really is. And that photo you mentioned in the Leedy factory, to me, and you would probably know better, but that is probably the only photo I've ever seen of this process, which mm -hmm. is amazing. I mean, it's that that one guy standing there. And I think I said it in Jim's episode. He's got a very unique haircut where it's like cut really high and he has like no sideburns whatsoever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that was that always sticks out that, to that me. Was, I think that was 1925 that photo was taken. It just said, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. And then there's the famous, um, what is it? The the cabin on fire in the forest or whatever. Uh, yeah, the, the forest fire scene, which I, I don't know. And it actually, the lights in it, they move. Now, I have a butterfly girl that you can see on my site that it flashes and it looks like her wings are fluttering. Wow. And that's the leady butterfly girl. So that's a cool head. But the forest fire actually looks like the forest is burning. I've never really seen it. I think I've seen Somebody has one, and I kind of did a video pan, and we could see it. But Mark Cooper's always talking about the forest fire. He's like, if you find that one, yeah. that's like one of the rarest ones out there. Yeah, it's so cool because it's so like grim. It's like, <laughs> do you really want that? Uh, someone's house burning down on the True. front of your yeah. drum, but it's really <laughs> cool. There's so much stuff you have. So painted drum heads are are one uh, really amazing part of it. But um, I want to touch on real quick though about how you said it's a playing museum, yes. meaning you can walk in. You can sit down. You can play these drums. You've had some famous drummers uh, come through. Steve Smith comes to mind right off the bat. You guys seem to have had a good uh, bond and become friends over this whole thing. Um, yeah, we have. Yeah. So that's wild. I mean, you can just do. You're pretty trusting to let not Steve Smith, but let to let anyone who comes in sit down and and play. You you can trust Steve, I'm sure. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of give people a little uh, preface when they come in. You know, I said you know because I have. You know, young guys come in here who are like heavy metal rockers, but they're interested in this stuff. So that's great. So I just say, hey, look, you know, the regular drums, they just have, you know, Weather King has them. You're not going to hurt them. But the the, the Chinese toms, you got to go a little easy on those and the calf heads because you can break them. But I've yeah. never had anybody come in and just like pound away on them. The drums are meant to be played, though. You're not really going to hurt most of them. You know, uh, you're not going to hurt the rim. So the heads, hey, if you break a head, but nobody's going to really play stuff that that hard in here. So I don't. I give them yeah. a, like a little tutorial before, when they come in because I have a whole tour that I do through here. It takes about a half hour to an hour, depending on how interested you are and how deep in the woods you want to get. Um, yeah. But you know, yeah, they they really can't hurt it. You know, uh, so I let them play. You know, that's what they're here yeah. from the symbols and everything. You know, you just got to take it easy. And, and it's actually amazing. Like Mark wrote in the article. Mark Mark Griffith wrote the article. And he said, it's amazing that you barely touch these drums and they just sing. 
You know, they just mm. they, they just really sound so good. These old 1920s and 40s, like a Chinese tom, especially the big ones. I mean, they sound as good as any floor tom that you're going to play today. You know, as long as the wow. weather is correct in here. I try to have humidifiers going and you know air conditioning and all that to keep it at a certain level, but it's tough. Why would that be? Do you think that it, these these old drums? I mean, the wood has aged and had time to you know mature. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I think it, I think it's all of that, especially like with a Radio King that's a solid maple shell. Just like with old guitars and old violins, you know, they're taking on eight you know years of just mellowing out and and not, you know, what sounds like a Radio King today? Nothing, nothing. Yeah. You know, what well, sounds like sure. a, a Slinger and Black Beauty or a Ludwig Black Beauty? The modern ones don't sound like that, and that's a brass shell, you know. But um, they don't. The new ones don't sound anything like the old. So, you yeah, know, uh, I guess it's, well, I guess it's time. The age of time makes them sound like yeah. that. Yeah. Which you can't buy. You, you can't buy, buy aging. Um, no. So you have a lot of uh, tons of stuff. I think it said in the article here that you had like you have like 30 kits or so in there. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that really popped out to me, um, and I think it's just neat because you have such a broad knowledge that we can just kind of jump around and talk about different sure. things. Yeah, absolutely. is about how kind of looking looking through it it talked about how you know there was the era of the the trap sets and the little tables and everything which we you know we, we look through old articles and things like that and we see everything was trap everything was you know all that stuff but there's a mention in this article that talks about it how I'll, let me read it here real quick it says however as soon as gene krupa came along he stripped away all of those gadgets from the drum sets and he started using his monogram shield on his front bass drum head so that speaks to why taking away all these the the, the you know trap stuff um, mm -hmm. and the switch from painted drum heads. So it kind of sums up a uh, really huge switch in the world of drum sets uh, in about one sentence. You it know, does. It's pretty fascinating. It, it, it does. And, and Gene was really responsible for a lot a lot of innovations at the at this. With the, and he was a Slingerland endorser. So Slingerland was really a newer company because Ludwig had been in business oh 20 years before Slingerland entered the drum game you know, they didn't really enter until 1928 um and so Gene you know came on later than that but he he was um he, yeah he, basically he wanted a monogram a real clean look to his set you know the toms were getting bigger they had the tack toms you know even his first tom was a tack tom um but then he he had them do, you know, tunable tops, and then they had tack bottoms. Well, then he was the one that said, "Hey, I want both sides tunable." So, you know, you can go, you can read about his history. But he was very innovative with the Slingerland company at making what we are we now know as the modern toms on a drum. Bass drums really haven't changed that much. They went from single tension to double tension, but you know that's not that big a deal. Yeah. But really, the tom toms and all the effects on that—that's what he really had a. A, a big influence in changing over to modern drums, you know, yeah. and the symbols got bigger and, and, you know, you didn't ride on a symbol. I had this great uh, discussion with Steve Smith. One of the times he was here because, you know, he was saying, you know, well, the twenties drums, you don't ride on a symbol that came much later, you know, and the beats all changed and everything the, you know, these, they were all effects. All the symbols were like these big China symbols. They were effects and little splash symbols. You rode on those, but you, you cupped them with your Pinch. hand and just made like, yeah. like a splash effect. Yeah. So Gene came along and then he, he just put the drums out in front of, of the audience, you know, and made, made it a solo instrument. And I mean, so much innovation came so fast really with, yeah. with, with him. Yeah. Cause even, even chick web, chick web before that was still using temple blocks, a trap table, you know, and he was, you know, he had a ride symbol, but he was still playing all those, all the traps along with that, you know, in his music, but it faded away yeah. pretty quick. Yeah. And Gene has been mentioned a lot on the show, which I think is rightfully, you know, he deserves it, but I think it's all, it's important to remind sometimes that like, yes, he's an incredible performer, soloist, uh, you know, as a drummer in general, but it's, it's also the the way the drum set changed is what makes mm -hmm. him so important. Not just, Oh, he battled with buddy rich and he did all this. And he <laughs> yeah, was, right. he was exactly. famous and a movie star. It's really the innovations yeah. and all that stuff that yeah. uh, makes it super important. Um, so you have some really, really amazing symbols as well, which I think is pretty cool, which 
symbols go back thousands of years. I, I don't know how far yours go back because that's that's kind of gets into a different world from like drum set symbols to like things like mm. from ancient China and all that stuff. Yeah. What's some of the older symbols that you have in your collection? Well, I would say some of the older ones would be the the bigger early China ones that came over from China, but you know, and some Zildjian K's from the twenties, but not big ones. Don't, you know, people are going to get excited. Oh, he's got the big 24 inch Zildjian K's from the twenties. No, I'm not a big K fan. Most of the drummers that I follow, like, like Gene and Buddy and all those guys, they just use Zildjian age, you know, Adidas Zildjian. Yeah. So that's what you're going to find on most of the kits in here. I have some smaller old K's and what I'm really into is the symbols that were used as hand symbols, foot symbols. I'm just going to grab something here. I'll just do a little, little yeah. tutorial. Something like this guy right here. <laughs> yep. The so Charleston to describe pedal. it for people listening, okay. yes, the Charleston where it's basically just two clamps. It's early, early <laughs> hi-hat. This is your first hi-hat. So this is put out by Ludwig. Ludwig uh, basically made this and it's wood. And you're like, that's the craziest looking thing, right? But this was the Charleston pedal, the, a dance the Charleston came out. So this was an afterbeat. So a lot of the mm. stuff is, is an offbeat. So you had your boom, your bass drum would be one. This would be two. Boom, chick, boom, chick. You know, so you'd have that that type of thing. But it was wood. Uh, and they sold these. And these are in the 1920s catalogs. I think as early as 22 or something. And then the 24. And then they went away quickly because then they made one that would fold up. And this is the one you see a lot. This is this is a low boy. Mm -hmm. So. And this one, all this Wahlberg and Ajay made this, and Leedy and Ludwig and Slinger and everybody sold them, but they fold up, so you, it was a little bit easier to to take with you to all these gigs. So, yeah. but th that's for the and then I like Bach of the Box, you know, and and all those kind of symbols, the hand symbols, yeah. and you can hear them in a lot of recordings. But that's the those are more rare than a lot of the other kinds of symbols you can find. But you know, on the on the sets, we we display all the little splash symbols and all kinds of you know hi hat symbols sure. and. The whole trans, you know, the the whole evolution of the hi hat. You can see it in here from the first one to the last one. An another fun topic, I think, which um, I have done a few episodes on, but it's been a while, so I think it's good to talk about is your collection of, um, you know, trap sound effects: whistles, ratchets, temple blocks, wood blocks, cowbells. Uh, I'm reading through them. I didn't just rattle that off without <laughs> off the top yeah. of my head. I'm reading this article, but you you have a really cool collection here. Um, What's some of your favorites and, and how do you go about acquiring old silent movie, you know, contraptions? Yep. So that's where the word traps came from is contraptions. Okay. And basically as a vaudeville drummer or as a silent film drummer, because for silent films, when they came out and, you know, everybody wanted to go to the film uh, to watch these, this new uh, film innovation thing, there were, there were no sound. You couldn't, they didn't have any sound with it. So, drummers were hired to actually make all the sounds that you saw in a silent film or background sounds like okay the perfect example is a train coming down the track right we have mm -hmm. a train sound effect made by ludwig that that's the but i usually end my tour with that and it sounds just like a train starting out and then going down the track and there's a, a train whistle that i put in my mouth and blow the whistle and then there's a train bell that you ding as it's coming into the station yeah. so train that's one of my favorites um, that's a good I one. Have, I got to say that that Ludwig yeah, train is very realistic. And then with very the metal, realistic. you hit it's the, loud. Yeah. Oh, it's loud yeah. too. Yeah. And it's like a screen door kind of spring is what it's been described as to me. <laughs> and we're going junk, junk, junk on the inside. It's pretty it, cool. It's a it's a box with a bunch of springs inside, and there's a, a lever with a uh, an angled piece of iron in there, and you're rubbing it across these springs. And you you know you also have to know what you're doing. You have to practice it just like you practice doing five stroke rolls. You have to start out slow in a real motion, then you have to get really fast as the train's barreling down the track and then go back down to slow. So it's like doing, you know, a roll from, you know, that, 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 and then all the way yeah. down to a press roll and all the way back out. It's kind of like that, you know, in a different yeah. way. Um, yeah. So that's a great one. That's one of my favorites. Uh, this One of my other favorites is a bear growl or a lion roar. So it's a box uh, with a hide on the back and, and a, a string and, a, uh, and, and put rosin on it, like, violin rosin and you pull the string and it makes a roar sounds like a lion roaring cool that's and an awesome one yeah there's dog barks and there's there's just uh one i got that i haven't even ever shown anyone is i have uh you know they had a lot of cowboy movies back in the day right so there was always a gunfight and bill ludwig jr he did a piece on kelly ray tubbs um back in time he did a piece yep. with he's got one of these and it's a surefire machine 
and it's a basically, I should have had it it's right there, but you hit it with a hammer, you put blank, real bullets in it. It has real bullets, not bullets, but real blank Blanks. cartridges in it. Yeah. Uh, black powder, and you, you can't do it inside a building because you'll set off the smoke alarms. He found that out. But yeah. it has 16 shots, and you put them in, and then as the as the guys are shooting the guns, you hit them with a hammer, and they fire just like a gunfire. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, and Ludwig you mentioned- made that crazy thing. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy sound effects, you know? Yeah. And you mentioned Kelly Ray Tubbs and then also Nicholas White in Chicago. Both He's great. my buddy. Yeah. Both great uh, ambassadors. Someone someone has to do it. You know what I mean? We all got to do our part to keep the history alive. And, and you you as well are, are all you guys are all doing a great job. Why don't you now kind of as you walk in the door, describe a couple little bit of the scenes that we'll see jumping from drum kit to drum kit. Um, you know, you can go into as much detail as you want, but mm-hmm. obviously for the sake of time, you have, sure. there's a lot of drum sets. So there's a lot. like, what's the first one you see? And then maybe skip along to some sort of highlights that, that are real crowd okay. favorites as they come can I, in. Can I talk about where these drums are housed first real quick? Y- yeah, Cause, absolutely. Cause that's really interesting. These drums are actually housed. You would not believe this, but they're housed in a renovated dairy barn from the 1800s, the downstairs cool. level. So if you know anything about barns, the upstairs levels where they put the hay. The downstairs levels where the cows were. So where mm. I'm sitting right now is basically behind me would have been cows on both sides. So obviously That's not awesome. anymore, but it was my grandparents' farm, believe it or not. This was my grandparents' farmhouse. So they they were farmers and this this was their barn. And then, you know, later on in life when they were pretty much, you know, done with it, I took it over and I didn't want to be a farmer. So I was an antique dealer. So I made it into an antique gallery and hence then it became the drum museum. So as you walk through the double doors in the front, you're going to come in. And if you turn to the right, you're going to see five kits set up. You're going to see the moose kits in the middle. You're going to see the butterfly girl flanked to the, if you're standing to the left, and then a Slingerland green glass glitter kit to the right, a sea green pearl kit behind that, and a top hat and cane kit behind the other group. So there's five kits there. Five drummers can sit down and play. Those are like my highlight kits in here. So they're all right there in this little alcove room with a stone wall behind them. You've seen the pictures on Facebook. It looks great. Yep. Um, So those are all, you know, five fabulous kits from the 1920s all the way to the mid 1940s. So you can get a fast tour real quick of how the toms evolved because that's what really evolved on these drums is how the toms evolved from Chinese toms to single head tack toms to then a regular kit going to the 1941 top hat cane. So. Uh, and then as, as you walk down through, there are more kits and you're going to, this is like a main hallway down here, uh, with kits displayed on both sides and, uh, right where I'm sitting under the banner, there's a, these are my trap kits. You're going to see a kit with all kinds of stuff on it, cowbells and wood blocks and just all kinds of gizmos and gadgets. And then a fifties kit here. And then as you go down that way in the main hall, there's a glass showcase filled with, uh, Slinger and Black Beauty snare drum, Ludwig Black Beauty, engraved snare drums, uh, some memorabilia, you know, from from back mm. in the day. Uh, actually, there's a trophy in there that I didn't really talk about much in the article. We'll talk. We're gonna talk about that. There's a trophy in that case from the 1941 swing contest that Gene Krupa and Slingerland sponsored. So mm. it was the second. It was uh, Louis Belson won that contest, and it would have been the same trophy that he got. Well, this was Joe wow. Rayner, the, the second place winner his trophy it's just so neat i feel like this is the kind of place where you, you need to focus like on so there's so many little details where like you see this trophy i mean the amount of history behind that competition and that what's trophy gra- is unbelievable. what's great is not just do i have the trophy i have all the letters from the slingerland factory to joe rayner uh they had you know a conversation back and forth because he got you as a first second and third runner up in that contest you got a slingerland radio king kit but that was the prize, as well as to sit with the big band and all this stuff. Well, anyway, he, he had ordered special sizes, and they upgraded his kit to chrome. And I have a picture of him sitting behind it. But there's all mm. these great, great letters from Slingerland Drum Company that I have them bind. You can sit here, you know, and look through those and read them. That's, that's they're all the original letters with the trophy. Wow. Yeah. So not to get off on that, but that's really an important yeah. thing that I don't think everybody feels that that everybody knows about or understands really how important that piece of memorabilia really is it started you know the guitar center still has the the drum contest that's what started it in 1941 that was the first one yeah so yeah it's it's an important benchmark in our in our careers here you know 
I would agree completely. And um, I mean, it 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 skyrocketed people into fame. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's without a doubt. Where obviously, I feel like each of these, you're getting them in different places, and it's just, uh, I mean, it's you're you're an antique collector dealer. I mean, you do auctions and stuff. But like, let's just stay on the trophy again, which again mm-hmm. was from a very famous competition that would be uh, like. It wasn't run by Gene Krupa, right? But it was he was like the face of it and the Well, Slingerland sponsored it. It was at the Wurlitzer Auditorium in New York, I believe. And uh Gene Krupa was the face of it because he was the judge. He came and judged the sure. drummers. They had to play sure. I don't think it was sing 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 at that time. I forgot it was something else, like maybe drum boogie or something. They had to yeah. play perfectly. And uh, yeah. he and so Louis Belson won. Joe Rayner came in second. I think Carl Kiff was third or something. I'm not sure, but I have a picture. I actually have a photograph of them the day of the contest. Gene standing in the middle, Louis Belson to his right with Bud Slingerland, and then mm. Joe Rayner's on the other side of Gene Krupa, and then two other guys. So I have the photo too. Interesting. It's just great. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So the question then is, is like, you know, Let's just again zero in on the trophy, which is just a really specific. It's not like a Black Beauty snare where it's like, you know, I mean, wh- where does one find a trophy like that? Like, how does that typical like hunt for something like that work? Yeah, uh, it came to me with a collection of drums, believe it or not. And it kind of right before COVID, um, I started the 1920s, 30s trap drum sets and sound effects page on Facebook. It's a group. And you can, a mm-hmm. lot of, I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this podcast are, are members of my group because it's pretty yep. active on um, there. And it's all about these drums that I love from the 20s and 30s and sound effects and stuff. And people post a lot of stuff. Well, a guy had posted that nobody had ever heard of before, posted that he, he started posting all these pictures of painted drums and all this stuff. And so uh, I re- he's, he was in Texas. His name was, I can tell his name. His name was Denny Harris, the Denny Hare Collection. So I reached out to him, a bunch of people, everybody was reaching out to him because uh, he was an older guy and it was time for him to maybe start selling. You know, like Jim Messina sold off his collection a couple of years ago. Well, Denny was in a, a position where he said, I don't need this stuff. I need to sell it. So I basically bought all of it. Now that's mm. in Texas. I'm in New York. So <laughs> I'm going, these aren't, you don't just put these in a UPS box and ship them. I mean, you're no. talking about. I mean, there were like 20 drum kits, you know, 20 wow. bass drums and maybe not that, maybe a du- at least 15 and then parts and all kinds of stuff. He said, I want to sell it all. I got guys that want to cream it and buy one thing. I said, don't do that. Don't do that because you're going to get stuck with all the stuff you'll never get rid of. So I made him an offer. He accepted it. The trophy came with it. That was awesome. part of the deal because Joe Rayner was his drum teacher and oh. nobody knew the trophy existed at the funeral his Joe Rayner's son or nephew or something else. And his nephew showed up with it and said, what should we do with this? Should we, they displayed it at the funeral. And then I guess they were like going to throw it away or something. And then he's like, no, I'll take that. So he took that with all the letters. So he had it. And basically it, you know, I purchased everything, including that for the museum. And not wow. even though I was going to do a museum at the time, but I just thought what a great collection. And I was like, okay, logistically, I was looking at flights. Am I going to fly to Texas? So, you know, this kind of comes into probably what you're going to ask is how do you, t- how do you acquire this stuff and what, how do you get it? Well, I'm going to answer yes. it ahead of your question. Uh, sometimes you think about, do I fly and get this? Because bass drums are big. They're hard to ship. You know, all the drum guys will tell you that. Well, yeah. my, my cousin's husband was, he's a truck driver and he was off for a month in the winter. So he was doing some side jobs. He was going to Florida uh, to d- help somebody take some stuff to Florida. And he had a, a van and a trailer. And I said, and I was just kidding. When I said, Hey, do you want to go to Texas and pick up some drums for me? And he's a drummer as well. He loves my museum. And he goes, hmm. yeah, I'll do that. And he did. <laughs> so I sent him from Florida to Texas and then home with this. And he, and he went and picked it all up and, and brought it to me. And, and it really is the base of my museum. A lot of the painted heads you've seen here came, not all, but a, a Bit half of them came from that. Sure. Collection. You know, some of it was just lower stuff. I had I parted it out, sold it off to pay for what I kept. But yeah. um, that's kind of how you acquire stuff. Sometimes you buy collections, and that's what I do in the antique business. I really buy estates, so that's what I like to do. I don't really buy one item at a time too much, only if it's really good. But I like to go buy a whole 
a lot of stuff and then go through it and find the treasures and, and then sell them off. And that, that's my yeah. business. So it's something yeah. that I'm, I'm used to doing. And that's maybe how you get some of this cool stuff, you know, in a lot. So, yeah, that's interesting. And then you kind of get that whole like uh, the surprise of you might not know what you're going to get, which is. There were uh, a few, yeah. <laughs> sort of addic- it's addicting, I'm sure, it's to be a, like, you know. It is, it is, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but when you That's put awesome. together collections, it's it's pretty easy to do, you know, like that when you're used to doing that kind of, some people can't wrap their head around buying that much stuff at once, you know, how do you deal with it, how do you pay for it, and how do you do all that? But if it's a normal thing you do for a job, it's pretty easy yeah. to just transfer well, it over to this, you know? I mean, it's a it's a business, and going back up to the top here, uh, looking at the stuff that's been sent over, you got your first job at an auction house at the age of 15, where you learned the antique business. And by 18, you started your own business. So this is not like we're like, you know, you're you're doing this little thing on the side. It's seriously, it's the mix of like your love of drums and your, I guess, love of auctions as well. I mean, two worlds came crashing together and this is the result, I guess, you know? Yeah. So outside of drums, what's your typical items that you sell? Uh, so in my store, which is actually above us now, because I had to move it up there when I did the drum museum, uh, I have an antique store. It's general merchandise, but I focus more around uh, country antiques from the 18th and 19th century. And then I kind of skip the Victorian age because it's not very popular right now. Then I do industrial, cool industrial mm-hmm. metal objects. And then mid-century modern is very hot. So I do a lot of yep. that. And I make a lot of lighting. So uh that also plays in well with restoring drums because I'm working with metal all the time because I actually create lights. I'm like a lighting designer and a lighting creator. Cool. So I, I make all this industrial style farmhouse style lighting. So when it comes to working with metal and having to fabricate things for drums or whatever, a lot of stuff I can, I can do right in my shop, which is right downstairs here on, on another section of the museum. Awesome. So, yeah. So there's a lot going cool. on in this one building, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The old yeah. dairy farm. I mean, auctions are really cool, like like real deal, which you're probably doing things with it every day. But I think for, for most people in the last decade plus, it's been online au- auctions. Right. I went to an auction once when I was younger with a friend. Um, I still enjoy them. I don't own one anymore, but I, I was in kind of a motorcycle phase, which was awesome. And mm-hmm. um buddy of mine we were we went to this and they were auctioning off old um harleys that were were amf when they were owned by like the italian amf company Mm -hmm. but so he bought a few i ended up buying i think this is sometimes what happens with auctions is i bought like 20 front fenders to vintage harleys for like Mm -hmm. 15 Mm dollars then i ended up having 20 of these things sitting around like a music space for like four years Mm -hmm. before anyone bought them and it's like i think you have probably learned you got to be careful what you buy because very. You could actually win it and then end up with a bunch of stuff sitting around. I mean, you, you've you got to kind of have a, a keen eye, yeah. which which you obviously do. Well, and actually how this whole space started down here, we'll back up just a little bit. I have an antique store upstairs now, but that's not how this started. Back in the day, eBay was a very hot venue. And as you know, a lot of good drums were sold on eBay. Mike Corrado got probably half of his collection through eBay <laughs> yeah. contacts, yeah. you know? So it was yeah. a very viable... Uh, online auction back in the day. I don't really consider it that great now, but back in the day, I'm talking 20 years ago, it was the thing. So I actually had an eBay store here and I had pickers out on the road buying for me, bringing the stuff to me. These are older guys that didn't even know how to turn a computer on. And I was a young, I'm not super computer savvy, but I knew how to do eBay. I took wonderful pictures. I took really good pictures and I I knew how to pack and ship stuff. So I created a business of saying, okay, bring me the stuff. I'll list it. Let eBay, you know, eBay on eBay, it'll sell. I'll pack it, ship it, and I'll take a percentage. So the reason why I'm telling you this is because while we were doing this, they were bringing me all kinds of stuff. And I said, oh, bring me drums and bring me guitars and horns and instruments because I I have a background in that stuff. I know and there's it's selling really well on eBay. So my guy started finding drums, you know, Mm -hmm. and guitars and stuff. And and we we sold violins, all kinds of stuff. But one day... One of my pickers came in and he had a Gretsch round badge, brass shell snare drum, deep one in the case with all the stuff, right fresh out of an attic. And he said, ah, you can buy this because I know you like, it was somebody who I didn't put stuff on eBay for. He just was a picker that sold stuff to me. So I bought it and I kept it for a little while. And then I said, I popped it on eBay. 
and I sold it and it, you know, it brought good money. But as soon as I put it in the box to ship it, I stopped myself and I said, what am I doing? I love this stuff. I should be buying it, not selling it. And that was the day I started collecting drums, believe it or not. Hmm. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It was like it was like all of a sudden I came in. I'm like, I should be so then I started buying, started looking on eBay, I started studying the catalogs, the old catalogs, the ones that I could source online. I think I bought a yep. Ludwig C D that had the catalogs and I started looking through all the old and that's when I fell in love with traps. You know, mm. they didn't really show painted heads in those rooms, but I saw all the cowbells and all the temple blocks and all the early kits and how cool they looked. And I'm like, I got to get one of those, you know. So then yeah. I think I bought my first one on eBay. I bought, and I still have it. It's a Leedy, the sil ship silhouette. And it came with temple blocks and the whole thing. And so I bought that. That was my first painted head trap kit I ever bought. And, uh, and then I didn't awesome. buy anything for quite a long time after that. But, um, you know, I go you go through times where you buy a lot and then you don't and then you know uh so i did that for a while i had some drums and then i did a house renovation and as you know when you do that you don't have money for drums so <laughs> no dear god no <laughs> i did a I big mean, house renovation so that that took all my money for that but then i got back into it and, and then because in the last 10 years this has been created in the last 10 years yeah, yeah. which yeah. is like a uh formalized museum i mean it's like a you can come and visit and 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 check it out and um what like are you open all the time i mean we'll we can get, we can plug it all more towards the end but like how do people come and visit you know so just you know call me email me message me on facebook i really try to give tours during the week because on the weekends obviously i'm open upstairs so it's a little tough yeah and that's when a lot of drummers you know they're gigging on the weekends anyway so i'll accommodate you on the weekend if, if we need to if you really want to see it you know, if that's the only time you can come, sure. we'll figure it out. But mostly I like to have people come during the week so I can block off time to spend with you because once you get in here, you don't want to leave. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. so much to see and so much to do and learn and play. And it's fun. It's a fun, even non drummers. I've had so many people come in that don't know anything about drums and I give them my tour and they go, that's the best museum tour I've ever had. This is so interesting. You know, it's yeah, just for sure. Fun. And I let them play. I mean, drums stuff. are. Drums are like, uh, we're biased because we love the drums. Yeah. But it's different than like if you go and you, and again you have a wide uh you know passion for a bunch of things with your your eye as a collector. But like you know if you go to a museum, you might not people might not love certain eras of art or there's you know right. certain kind of glass work. I feel like drums are just like really cool to everyone, and it's mm -hmm. just such an ancient instrument, and it has well, some, it's jazz, it's everything, it's it's really just a fun thing for drummers and non-drummers yeah. to be looking well, at. You know why? Because even a non-drummer, you can put a pair of sticks in their hand, and they can tap on a drum, and, and they can get a sound out of it, where, hand me a guitar, I don't know anything about a guitar, I mean, I can strum, <laughs> yeah. but it sounds terrible, I mean, yeah. <laughs> right? You, a a non-drummer can, can at least play a drum, and it, they get something out of it, you know? They can hear sure. what it sounds like, that, you know they can't play rhythms like buddy rich but they can play yeah. usually every somebody has rhythm you can play a rhythm on a drum and get something out of it like piano guitar any other put a trumpet in your hand you can't even play i can't even make a trumpet play you know <laughs> no, no. So, so a trumpet museum yeah. would be no good for me to go to you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't start the northup uh trumpet museum please i, I promise um, i won't <laughs> are you still acquiring things are you still expanding is this never ending the uh oh, the yeah. museum of course always because yep. you're always you know, it's it's full. I will say it's pretty full right now. But you're always, I guess I'm always upgrading. And I, I and uh, in the article, uh, okay. So Bob Myers, I don't know have you, have you talked to Bob Myers yet? But Bob no, his called, name his name has come up. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a professional drummer, and he's he loves this place. He's been here a few times, and and he has a good collection too. He calls me two for Tim, two for Tim. And I said, what do you <laughs> call me that for? He goes, because you like two of everything, and I do. And it's in the article. They talk about that. Mark said, why, yeah. why do they call you two? Well, I said, if you have two of something rare, if something else comes along that's rare, you have something to barter. See, the antique business Smart. is a barter game. You yeah. like try to get Nick White to sell one of his sound effects. He won't. But yeah. if you have something to barter with him that he doesn't have, he will barter with you. you know? So sure. just as an example. Uh, yeah. So I'm always looking for better examples of stuff I have maybe, um, mm -hmm. you know, and if something comes up, like I, I bought, I got a slinger on black beauty, which is sitting right next to me, which is one of the, we'll talk about that. I'm sure, but that's one of the rarest drums in the world. 
Well, yeah. I bought that one and then like not six months later, somebody saw it on, on the on my site, which is usually what happens, and contacted me from Canada and said, I think I have one of those. Jeez. And I'm like, well, send me pictures. And he did. And sure <laughs> enough, he did. He did. Wow. He had one. Was he a not was he a drummer himself or was this like a Yeah, he was a drummer, but you want to go into the story? It's a great one. Yeah, please t- tell us about it. So Slingerland Black Beauty, 1928, it was in the new the first Slingerland catalog. Okay. It was never in any catalog after that. I think the next one came out in 30 or 32. Not very many were made. Right now we know we think 18, 18 of them in the world. Hmm. I own number 17 and number 18. Okay. Wow. So 17 I bought from Jim Messina. He had purchased, he did a great video on it. He found it in Florida from an old guy over on the East Coast who actually used to live in Syracuse, New York, or near Syracuse, which is two hours from me up here in New York. He got that drum in the 60s from a guy that found it in an attic in Syracuse in the 1960s. So, and he had it for years, played it. Now, he never did anything to it, so it needed some restoration. It didn't need parts. It just needed to be cleaned and relacquered and all that. So we we did that, and it's the one sitting next to it. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful example of a Slingerland Black Beauty. Shell is hmm. in like mint condition. It's really nice. Can people play that if they come to the museum? Absolutely. And and that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a big draw Wild. because where else are you going to do that, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So I got that one, and, and I'm like, okay. I'm set. I've got my Slingerland Black Beauty. I wanted one forever. I missed one at the Chicago show two years ago, you know, two years before I bought this one. It just wasn't the right time and I didn't buy it. And I, I regretted it ever since, you know, yep. but I loved it because this was from Syracuse and I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about that with some other kits that came from Syracuse and we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's continue sure. with the Black Beauty story. So I bought this one, had it, was in love with it. Guy calls, guy gets a hold of me from Canada, says, I think I have one. Here's the great story. I said, tell me the background of this Black Beauty. He goes, well, I was a teacher and I'm retired now. And uh, there was another teacher. We were both retiring at the same time. And she came into my classroom and said, look, we're cleaning out my father's house. There's a drum and a black case. We don't have any use for it. Do you want it? You can have it. Otherwise, we're going to put it on the curb or send it to Goodwill or throw it away. One or the other. Okay. He goes, yeah, bring it in. But he goes, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. She goes, I'm not either. I'll bring it in and drop it off and you know whatever. So he never saw her again. She brought the drum and left it on his desk. He comes in like the next week, opens it up, and it's just some great black drum. He, he didn't know what it was. He figured it was just a Ludwig. So he had it for a while. Now, remember, this thing was going to go in the trash or to goodwill or something. So he got this drum for free. So he get, gets hold of me. Anyway, I said, yeah, it's a Slingerland Black Beauty. So I bought it and I shipped it from Canada to here. I did the label. And of course, FedEx drove me crazy because they lost it. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it went off, you know how it goes off the radar all of a sudden. It's like, oh, it's, your package is not trackable right now. And I'm like, it was supposed to be here overnight. You know, I paid to have it oh. sent overnight. Talk about Jeez. giving me a heart attack because you can't insure yeah. it. So you paid all this money and you're like winging oh, it, you man. know. So wow. I, d- I yeah. did I did do a, an opening here for it and we opened it up and, and I, I really did open the box and do it and I, on live on Facebook where I, I had not <laughs> seen the drum. And it's beautiful. Awesome. And I have not, I chose not to restore them because it's not in bad shape. You know, the shell could be cleaned and relacquered, but it's beautiful. It's all yeah. original. It's all intact. The gold is shiny. It's really beautiful. Um so I got that one, you know, right after this one, which was crazy, crazy, crazy. man. Yeah. And there, there may be more out there, which oh, I feel sure. like the yeah, hunt sure. goes on the beyond the 18. On. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Jeez. And then you said other drums in Syracuse. Is there, so what's special about Syracuse? Okay. So, and the problem is Slingerland drum company doesn't have files to go back that far. They probably had fires or they just threw them out. Back in the 20s, you know, 30s, I guess we'll go to the 30s because that's when Slingerland was really cranking out the stuff. They were new in the drum business, 28, they got in. So there must have been a really good music store in Syracuse that sold Slingerland because this Black Beauty came from there. My green glass glitter kit with a side trap table, which Mm -hmm. nobody's ever seen one, that whole kit came from the Syracuse area and Mm -hmm. a sea green 
glass, a sea green pearl set came from the same place. All came from Jeez. the same place in Syracuse. And a very rare broadcaster drum in a uh, which is a solid maple shell with a walnut veneer over it. Again, made for one or two years, very rare. All came from the same area. So there had to wow. be a, some music store that was getting like the prototype stuff, the really early good stuff, you know, from Slingerland yeah. at that time. Yeah. Just a I weird. I love yeah. that. It's just that like that next level, like the history can keep going deeper and deeper of like, here's a cool drum, but here's where it came from. Oh, exactly. and that area must have had some serious collectors and some some people with some well, uh, a, a you know, serious disposable music store money. Because that, um, that, they all came out of houses, you know, that I basically sourced. And uh, it's funny that there must have been a really good music store in that area that sold that stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm sure yeah. there are. I mean, you go to Chicago, New York City, you're going to find stuff like that. But for it to turn up in a small town, I mean, Syracuse isn't so small, but it's still, it's an upstate yeah, yeah. New York town and to find all this rare stuff there, you know? So I'm sure yeah. everybody's going to be running to Syracuse now <laughs> trying to find <laughs> yeah. stuff. But no, I already got it all. <laughs> it's, see, yeah, Syracuse has been, uh, they have no drums left there. That's oh. hysterical. Awesome. Well, let's talk about New Jersey Percussion Ensemble. So Peter Jarvis, and you, mm -hmm. you had a podcast with Pete. Yep. yep. Good friend of mine. Um, they actually came here Pete wrote eight pieces for the New Jersey Percussion Ensemble, eight pieces for snare drum, four snare drums in this museum. So they came oh, cool. in, they chose snare drums right off my rack. You know, we kind of, Pete and I kind of went through the pieces and what kind of snare drum he wanted. So we chose all vintage drums. They recorded this Black Beauty, probably the first time it's ever been, a Black Beauty has ever been recorded maybe. And they, mm. they turned this place into a recording studio. The sound in here is phenomenal, by the way. You can That's just come awesome. in and yeah, Steve comes in with his three cameras and just records and his guy said he barely has to edit it. It's great. The it sounds great. Cool. So they, they recorded, um, you know, basically they recorded eight pieces and then we did, I think four other pieces and it's out on a CD. It gets released tomorrow on iTunes, Amazon music, um, Spotify. It's Jarvis and friends volume four. It's, it's that's the outside of my place right there. For the YouTube cool, yeah. people watching YouTube, you get to see it. But uh, to me, that's a really big deal. Oh, know? yeah, that's awesome. And Pete's a great guy. And uh, like you said, former guest on the podcast. So it's cool He's just a, kind of cross, you know, uh, promoting each other's stuff. Pete Jarvis is a genius composer and musician. Yeah, he really is. Yep. And he's a good friend. That's but awesome. he's, yep. It was great. So we've done that. And then um, I don't know. Do you want to talk about Steve Smith? Yeah, please do, because you guys clearly from from his promotion of, you know, he's he posts videos. It's obviously good for business for you, but he genuinely clearly likes coming there. I mean, you guys seem to have, you guys seem to have built kind of a, you know, pretty good friendship. So what's the story with that? OK, it's a great story and I'll, I'll keep it. Sh I'll shorten it a little bit for you. But <laughs> basically, um, Steve found out about my my drum collection. I was not a museum at the time. He found out about my drum collection because um, I, I, I make, remember I told you I make lights, I make lamps, and I make lighting. And I sell them, some of them in a bookstore downtown that he frequents. Uh, he actually lives near here. He has a summer home near Oneonta that he stays that at makes sense. part of the summer. So he's here. Uh, so he went into this bookstore, bought a lamp, and then his wife was checking out my Facebook page and saw a post of a Steve Smith drum head that I'd acquired. I said, I was all excited. Oh, look, I got a drum head from Steve Smith that he signed to somebody, you know, and I had it for the collection. And so he saw the pictures of this place. Well, his neighbor where he lives actually knows me. So his neighbor brought him here to my, to the drum collection. And I didn't know if Steve was going to like old drums. I mean, he's a, he's a, you know, he played with journey and he was a jazz sure. drummer for idle information. I knew all that. And I followed him over the years, but I, who knew if he liked old drums? So he comes in and he's very nice. He and his wife and my friend came and he goes, well, these drums look great. He goes, can you play them? And I said, yeah, sure. He says, I can play. I said, yes. Yeah, so he sat down and now there wasn't as much out as there is now. Of course, you guys can't see it, but there were, I, I put out everything I had at the time, you know, because I knew he was coming. So I made a presentation. Yeah. Uh, Bart, he came in, he sat down and played everything I had out. <laughs> That's really awesome. well too and and he's just and at one point he's smiling ear to ear and his wife turns to my girlfriend lynn and my friend ron who had brought him here and says oh my gosh he's having a blast he's just having the time <laughs> of his life you know and yeah. so we played everything it was very nice he gave me some gifts and it was just great meeting steve smith i mean it was like you know a dream come true so on the way out he he signed a drum head for me right 
-hmm. and he said uh great museum i should have had it but he said great music he wrote on the drum head thanks for the visit great museum and he's the first one that coined the frame the phrase museum to me wow like, oh i guess i do have a museum he called it a museum <laughs> yeah. so if steve smith calls it a museum i guess you better change your name <laughs> Yeah, then it then you added on museum. I mean, I, well, that's I did. totally I did. true. I did. <laughs> so he calls me two days later and he goes, would you mind if I came and recorded some of your old drums? You know, recorded some pieces on your drum. And I, what are you going to do? Tell Steve Smith? No, I guess I really <laughs> wouldn't like that. I said, yeah. I would be I would be on. And sure, that would be great. So he came. He said, we're going to be there all day. He says, I'm going to bring my equipment. So he came like mid morning and he was here all day. And we laid down, he laid down four or five recordings with video mm. and he's been releasing those. He released one like pretty quick right after he has a guy that added some stuff, puts his from the practice room. And then he called it sure. from beyond the practice room. And, uh, what, what a great day that was. I spent the whole day with Steve Smith here recording. Yeah. I mean, that was, it just like, not that you need legitimizing or anything, but it just re encourages what you're doing. When someone of that stature says, this is cool, keep going, can I come and play with you yeah. and do stuff there? I mean, talk about like, just like a bit of a pat on the back, you know, yeah. that's yeah. awesome. And just because I'm a crazy collector, and put all this stuff out, <laughs> put it together. And then all of a sudden, yeah. you know, Steve Smith comes and Modern Drummer comes. And I mean, I don't know, it's who knows what's going to happen in the future. I guess that's what I'm waiting to see with the article. Who's going to come now that didn't know about you know, because my only presence was really on Facebook and Instagram and a little bit, you know. So yeah. now that it's got national, you know, um, in the spotlight, let's let's see who comes in the future to visit. Yeah. So we may have to totally. do another, another podcast and do up a lineup <laughs> of who comes. <laughs> yes. Well, people listening to this um, are usually diehard drum fans, and yeah. many of them probably live within driving distance. So um as you mentioned before it's basically get in touch with you during mm -hmm. the week uh yep. make your way over to you know north of drums on facebook which i'll i'll post all the links to sure. everything down yeah. there let me just logistically tell people where we are just so you okay. know it's pretty easy sure. we're basically three hours from everywhere in the on the east coast so we're three hours we're gonna say three to four we're three to four hours from boston three to four hours from new york city three to four hours to Rochester and Buffalo and three to four hours to the border of Canada. So we're kind of right mm. in the middle and we're right near Cooperstown, New York. So everybody knows Cooperstown baseball hall of fame. Mm -hmm. I'm basically 30 minutes from Cooperstown. That's awesome. Yeah. So That's very, cl very close. Yeah. And just to let people know, if you can't get here, say you're in another country, you know, say you're in England, I've done a lot of stuff with sticky wicket, you know, you know, Alan mm -hmm. sticky wicket. I have He's yet a, to, I need to have him on the show. I'm a fan of his you YouTube You need to content. have him on the show. He's yeah, great. Yeah, I know. So we did some video things together. At, uh, you know, Styx and I have done some video collaboration uh, with this museum and then with uh, his friend Harry. So we've done some stuff. Uh, and he's going to come here when he comes to the States. He's going to come visit me and stay for a while. We'll, and we'll post some video. It's going to be fun whenever he gets cool. here. Um, yeah. but, if you can't, but if you can't get here, you know, it's not possible for you to actually get here. I am going to offer what we're doing right now kind of is, is like a Zoom. We, we can do a Zoom tour, a virtual tour of the museum. If you want to see something, you know, want to see something uh, specific, we can talk about it. I can play it for you. Um, you won't get to play it. But um, yeah. and that one I am going to right now, there's there's only like a donation. If you want to come to the museum, you don't have to give anything. It's free. Um, yeah by donation if i do the zoom thing just because i've got to schedule the time and have the equipment i am gonna there's gonna be a fee for that but you know you're we, you know i will give you a wonderful tour sure and up to up to an hour with you here looking at everything yeah. playing everything looking at stuff in great detail yep so we can do that by yeah zoom. absolutely yeah that sounds fun and and i mean as as uh again anything that I can, I will share um, in the description where you're, you know, on Tim's website and everything. And, and, you know, you have to, there's a value that goes to you putting in the time and, and walking through it with people. So I think that's worth, you know, paying for and all that good stuff. Sure. So awesome, Tim. Well, I'm very glad that we, we got, you know, together. I know you've been a busy guy and you're getting, you know, everything put together and, um, and all that good stuff. So really pumped to have you here. And for people listening, Tim has been kind enough. He's going to stick around and we're going to do one of the Patreon bonus episodes. Um, and the question is going to be about, um, 
Tim is going to explain how to put together a trap kit and how to acquire it and uh, basically build out one of the really cool, you know, 1920s trap kits that we all love uh, to look at and has all the accessories and cool things that that got you into it to begin with. Um, so if you want to hear that, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, Patreon link, and uh, you can, you know, hear those for two bucks a month. So, Tim. This has been awesome, man. I hope to come to the museum someday. I'm a little further away than four hours. I'm in Cincinnati, so I'm probably seven or eight or nine hours, I think, just kind of totally guessing. But someday I will make it there. Great. Can't wait to have you. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Well, thank you for being here. Thanks. It was great. I had a great time.